Hello, my name is Pastor Sean. Welcome to the reading of from the book of Psalms. I almost said of the book of Psalms. And what we're going to be reading today for this Bible study video is going to be Psalm 3, verse 3 starting. And we're going to end it with Psalm 5, verse 11. And so what I'm going to do is read these two first, uh, these two pages here of the Bible. And then also read the bonus commentary describing most of the verses. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and pray and then we will start the reading. Dear Heavenly Father, please let us get all that we can out of these pages together, Heavenly Father, for this Bible study video. It is in your holy, precious name, in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with the reading. Okay, so starting with verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Sheila, or Sela, not pronouncing that right, S-E-L-A-H. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me from all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all of my enemies on the cheekbone. <clears throat> You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. Now we're going to go to Psalm 4, verse 1. The safety of the faithful. So verse 1. Actually, well, uh, first part to the chief musician with string instruments, a Psalm of David. So now verse 1. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me of my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O oh, you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long would you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Selah. Now verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Selah. Verse 5. Offer sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up your light on your countenance upon us. <clears throat> you have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So next one, Psalm 5, is uh, kind of a long one. A prayer for guidance to the chief musician with flutes, a Psalm of David. So verse 1. Give ear to my word, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry. My King and my God, for to you I will pray. Verse 3. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell within you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, I will continue into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. Cast them out into the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against you. And now for the last verse, verse 11. But let all those who rejoice, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. So we'll go ahead and stop right there. And then I'm going to read the bonus, bonus commentary explaining most, if not all the verses. Okay, so we're going to start with Psalm 3. And this is what I said in the last video for the last two lines here. 
Psalm 3 is a lament psalm ascribed to David. The superscription indicates a precise setting, the period of David's flight from his son Absalom, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, this is one of the few psalm titles that ties a psalm to a specific incident in the life of David. The brief poem has four movements. Number one, David's opening lament, which is verse one and two. Number two, his strong confession of trust, which is verse three and four. Number three, his determined act of faith, verses five and six. And then last one, number four, his continuing plea, verse seven and eight. Okay, so now we're going to go over verse one and two. So many, meaning at this point in David's life, there was one specific foe who troubled him greatly, his son Absalom. However, David's friends had also become his foes because they were advising him that no one would help him, not even God. Selah, for the next part, this is a musical term perhaps indicating a pause in a lyric for the musical interlude. Okay, so that's what Selah means. Verses 3 and 4. So next part, the phrase, but you, O Lord, changes the mood of the psalm from dejection to confidence. David says that, David says three things of the Lord. Number one, when no one would help David, God was his shield. Number two, when David had nothing to treasure, God was his glory. And number three, when no one would encourage him, God himself would encourage him and lift up his head. Next part, Holy Hill is a poetic reference to God's dwelling in heaven. The place of Israel's worship uh, was but a physical symbol of his dwelling. So next part, verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 3. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. I lay down and slept. So that means here, given the stress that David faced, it is remarkable that he was able to enjoy a night's rest. This was possibly only because of God's sustaining power. God's gift of rest may be given even in the most troubling times, and I've witnessed that myself. Next part, I will not be afraid, which means when God is one's protector, there is no need to fear. That's going to be uh, also referencing Psalm 23, verse 4, uh, Psalm 27, verse 3, and Psalm 118, verse 6. Next part, verse 7 and 8. In the language of the Lament Psalms, David calls out for God to arise, to move on his behalf, to incline to his prayer. Verse 40, or I'm sorry, Psalm 40, verse 1. Next part, on the cheekbone. Uh, in the poetic imagery David uses, his enemies are like powerful beasts whose strength is in their jaws and whose terror is in their teeth. God's strikes at the source of their strength means that they are no longer a threat. So next part, salvation, in this instance, refers to deliverance from the immediate pressure that the psalm uh, has already described. One meaning of the Hebrew word translates salvation is room to breathe. Okay. Next part, your people, uh, as is the pattern in psalms, the experience of the individual becomes the template for our or for the community. Now, next, Psalm number four. Uh, so, Psalm four is linked to Psalm three in mood and concept. Both speak of the possibility of finding such peace in God's presence that even when torn by physical and emotional pain, a person may still have restful sleep. And that's going to be Psalm three, verse five, and then Psalm four, verse eight. So this is a lament psalm of the individual, but one in which there was an unusual degree in confidence. Psalm 4 is the first of the psalms to have a superscription that focuses on its musical nature. The next one to the chief musician, which means uh, the chief musician is a notice that indicates that this psalm is from an early collection of psalms used in temple worship. So there you go. I, I didn't even know that. Okay, with stringed instruments, specifies that musical setting for the psalm. What The musical setting for the psalm. Okay, so straightforward. Next part, a psalm of David serves not only as a notice of authorship, but also as a reminder that the poem was to be sung. Uh, the structure of the psalm is as follows. Number one, a petition of deliverance, verse one. Number two, 
uh, an address to the wicked, encouraging them to turn from falsehood and to trust in God, which is verse 2 through 5. Number three, an assertion that only God is able to provide genuine joy, deep peace, and abide safely, abiding safely, or safety, verses 6 through 8. Next part, which is going to be describing verse 1, O God of my righteousness, can also be translated, O my righteous God. The phrase has two meanings. Number one, only God is righteous. And number two, all of the person's righteousness is found in him alone. The psalmist is facing a very pressing need, but his confidence in God remains especially strong. He addresses God in terms of his character, his righteousness. Then he speaks of God's uh, earlier saving works in his life. Uh, you have relieved me in my distress. So, uh, so now verse 2, how long, which means the psalmist often use these words to question God, which is also in Psalm 13, verse 1 and 2. Here, uh, they are, um, here they are addressed to the wicked. Okay, so next part, my glory. For the believer, one sense of glory or honor is found in relationship to the Savior. Next part, verse 3, set apart. This is the central point of the psalm. God has identified the godly, those who are devout to God and his ways. He exercises special care over them and listens to their prayers. Okay, now verses 4 and 5. Be angry and do not sin. Which means that these words are cited by Paul in the New Testament to describe righteous indignation, which is also in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26. Here the psalmist exhorts his readers... Uh, not to let anger or anxiety erode complete trust or faith in the Lord. Next part, uh, for the sacrifices of righteousness. These words speak of the salvation experience. Now next part, put your trust in the Lord. Those being addressed here are the wicked. So that's going to be also in Psalm 1 verse 4 through 6. Thus in the Psalm, the poet calls his neighbors to put their faith in God which is also in Psalm 67. And next one for verse 6. Uh, any good, which is, although our lives often seem to be filled with uncertainty, there was never uncertainty with God. Okay, next part. Light of your countenance, which is also in verse 6 in Psalm 4. This phrase recalls the Aaronic benediction, which is in Numbers chapter 6, verse 26. That indicates God's favor. Those on whom the Lord shines his face are truly blessed. Grain and wine, verse 7. The joy God gives transcend, transcends the joy of the harvest. Agriculture produce, the result of abundant rain on fertile soil, was a blessing of God on his people. But there was something greater than full barns and overflowing cisterns, the joy of God's presence. Sorry, just turned the stove on. Okay. Next, verse 8. The peace that God gives is far from the relaxation technique. It is a peace that enables an anxious person to lie down and sleep, which is in Psalm 3, verse 5 that we just read. Next, Psalm 5. A lament psalm. Excuse me, sorry. A lament psalm speaks of an unspecific, unspecified but distressing period of David's life. A time marked by enemies who verbally opposed him and his rule. When David's enemies hurled curses at him, they believed that those curses called on divine power to destroy him. In this psalm, David is in distress because of the lies and boasts of his adversaries. Psalm 101 verse 7. He identifies his own cause with that of the Lord, so that attacks on him became attacks on God himself. The righteous, in verse 12, ultimately points to the Savior, Jesus, as is common in the book of Psalms, which is also in Psalm 1, verse 6. The psalm has three mo movements. Number one, a prayer to the Lord for deliverance in a time of trouble, which is verse 1 through 6. Number two, a desire to worship the Lord in a time of trouble, verse 7 through 9. And then number three, a longing for final judgment by the Lord in times of trouble, verses 10 through 12. So next, 
It's going to be one through three. So give ear, uh, which means as in um, verse one of Psalm four, this is the language of a person who believes from experience that God has forgiven his plight or forgotten his plight. Sorry, right, right there. Uh, the sufferer calls on the Lord to listen, even though the Lord has continually, will always continually listen and care. Meditation here refers to incessant groaning. Oh, I didn't know it was meditation. Okay. My king, the next part. The psalmist often addressed God in heaven as king, the ruler over all. At times, the psalms focus on prayer in the morning. In the morning, which is also in Psalm 88, verse 13. A commendable habit that helps a person to dedicate all of the activities of the day to the glory of God. Okay, so verse 4 and 6, or 4 through 6, take pleasure. That means to find enjoyment or reason for laughter. There is no enjoyment to be found in evil. The Hebrew word for boastful is the same one used to describe the praise of God. The praise of God is the focus of the psalmist, but praise of self, a mere boast, is a twisted human perversion of true praise. Next part, not stand. This psalm speaks of final judgment on the wicked. Compare Psalm 1 verse 5. They will not be allowed to stay in his glorious presence. You hate, next part. God's hatred is not merely a feeling, but an action of his will. The phrase, workers of iniquity, occurs often in the Psalms to describe those who are characteristically practice evil. Who characteristically practice evil. That's also in Psalm 14, verse 4. So in Numbers 7 and 8 of Psalm 5, uh, but as for me, next part, in the Hebrew text, these words indicate a sharp contrast with the previous description of the wicked. The Hebrew word temple can be used of any large structure. So any large structure can be technically a temple in uh, the olden times. Palace or big house. David was a leader in reforming the worship of God in Jerusalem. And he established a structure for the worship that would take place in the temple to be built by Solomon, his son. David uses the word temple in anticipation of the future glorious building. All later, generations of Hebrew worshipers who understand their own worship better because of the use of his word in these Psalms. Make your way straight, next part. David prayed that God would make clear his will for him. And now we're going to go over 9 and 10, the verses there. Their throat is an open tomb. And this is probably my favorite, it's my favorite part to read there, being a poet myself. These words describe the perverse language used by people in opposition to God. Paul used the words of these verses to argue for depravity of all people, which is also in Romans chapter 3, verse 13. And now the final part, I'm just going to talk about rejoice in verses 11 and 12, and then we'll go ahead and end this video. So here the psalmist describes the joy of the saved, the ecstasy of the ones whom God saves from their own um, deserved destruction. Destruction. Our joy must always be focused on our Savior, which is also in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. So thank you for watching today's video, and I will come back to do tomorrow's video on Wednesday for the next part of the Bible study. This is Pastor Sean, and God bless.